Hi, everybody. Welcome to Ideas On. In every one of our Ideas On podcasts, four of us take a look at one topic from four different points of view. So uh, let me welcome everybody. Duncan Kennedy. Hello. Jared Wells. Greetings. And Olivia Allen. Hi. And I'm Bob. So the topic of the day, before we go away, is poetry. Uh, you tried. I tried. I gave it a shot. I'm not a rhymer anyway. Poetry. So speed round. Uh, Jared, where'd you go with this one? So uh, I sort of looked at poetry as as kind of a, a form of relationship counseling for people who use words. I, <laughs> I, I think I think it's really a structure through which humans can redefine their relationship with what words are, what they mean to us as a species and how we use them, as well as as what they mean and who really defines what they mean. I, it was, it, it's a question that I've always found fascinating. I'm, a, I'm much more of a prose guy, but I got into poetry and really realized that, wow, you can, you can really innovate language here in a way that you can't when, you, when, you write, uh, when you're writing a novel or when you're writing, especially for a business document. So that's where my, uh, that's where my head went on this one. Olivia, where'd you go? I'm a big poetry person. Um, these are only some of the poetry books I have in my house. Um, and I write poetry, so I I went from a pretty personal angle about I, I didn't really know how to start, so I kind of started it, and it ended up as a poem, and then I wrote prose things. But uh, poetry as really anything, poetry, my poetry as um, spirituality and therapy and general getting through life. Um, I think, I just think poetry is such a broad definition. Um, and I, I wrote about that. Cool. Duncan. Uh, very little experience with poetry besides some family members who were excellent writers and poets. And, you know, as a family member, I buy their anthologies and enjoy reading them. But I, I basically chickened out and talked about song lyrics. Well, hey, you know, can't can't argue with that. Yep. For for me, I'm I I do write poetry and have most of my life. I'm not prolific. I write slowly, but but um for me it was all about love of language. To, you know, to really my my perspective is, you know, the poem you know, if, if great prose is a nice glass of Chardonnay, um the poem is a really extraordinary Napoleonic brandy. You know, it's distilled down to this essential blast of intensity. So, so I just, I think to me, it's just a celebration of the things you can do with, with language, you know, is sort of where I wanted to go. That's so interesting to me because uh, for me, it's, it's kind of the other way though. I wouldn't use the alcohol metaphor because I don't know as much about alcohol as you. I'm a college student. Um, That's an oxymoron. I mean, <laughs> I'm a college student without epilepsy. I drink wine and that's like <laughs> it. Um, but um, I, to me, prose is the distilled one because prose is carefully crafted and you have your best friend who knows how to do grammar edit it 30 times. And it's, it's meticulous, but Poetry is you cut yourself open and bleed onto a page, <laughs> and that's what it's there. Interesting. Raw. I would knock on to that that um, to me, uh, when you write, you are creating a universe of characters yes. and a reality, and it has depth. And depending on how much you write and how prolific you write, is the meter for the depth of that alternate universe you're allowing your reader to step into. Poetry is sharp, clear-cut, evocative sensations or emotions mm -hmm. that you viscerally experience crisply, yes. and then it's gone. So it, it's it's the prick of the of the stick in your finger is the poetry, whereas the saw the balm of the hands is the long narrative to you know soothe and ease away the calluses where you know poetry is ripping the callus off. 
Yeah. I'll, I'll agree with that because I think po- poetry is a drop. Yeah. You know, a, a good narrative is is a nice, a good drink of water. Poetry is a drop, but it's a really intensely flavored drop. Yeah, absolutely. I, that- I have written poems. I, I, when I world build, I world build. I have notebooks full. Um, and I've written poems about my characters and their experiences. Hmm. But yeah, like you said, you could read them out of context and not need any of that background about, oh, her wife died and this and this and this. Uh, no, it's about a woman who had an experience. Hmm. I've always I've always found that prose, uh, to your points, prose is, is almost like a record keeping sort of thing to some extent. Every prose is, is, is describing something. It, it, it is describing a thing, even if it's first person prose, it's describing a thing as seen. And poetry is describing a thing as felt, which I think is something that I, I think is, it, it, um, unless it's poetic prose, it's very difficult to accomplish any other way because it is, it, I, I, when I write poetry, which I've done more so in recent years, I, I really liken it to, um, you know, getting into a, the groove of an instrumental solo or a jazz solo or whatever, where you are just putting onto the page minute after, I mean, second by second, just spewing it out there. And yeah, you might go up there if you want to read, if you're going to read it to people, maybe you go back and polish it, but it, it really is kind of like the the guitar solo of the literary world, the way I see it. Yeah, I'll tell you the other thing about that. Is it, it's poetry, well, for me anyway. Um, I'm going to think about this. I think definitely when I write it, but but I think the more I think about it, the, even when I hear it, someone else's or read it, it is intensely personal. Yep. Prose, particularly a lot of the kind of prose we write, and I'm not the writer you guys are, but you know, we've got we we write a lot of prosaic stories about other people, about characters. Some of them we invent, some of them we have to work with. Poetry to me is extremely personal, and and to your to your point. My poetry is always 100% about a felt sensed re- otherworldly reality, so- something that that happened inside my emotional envelope. The, o- the other thing I'd say, too, that I noticed in, in poems is, you know, I, how you read a story when you re- when you read a story with well, most people, there are people who don't. They're the people who hate reading. But for most people, you read a story and it's making pictures in your head. Right. As you're reading. The pictures poetry makes for me are more like art, right? They're yeah. like they're like paintings. The when I read a book or a great novel or even a great biography, uh, a nonfiction book, it's it's scenes, it's movies, it's or at least storyboards, right? But it's not art. With, po- with poetry, it's very, very artistic. It's very, very uh, symbolic looking. Almost Rorschach tests sometimes. Yeah, it very much is. Yeah. So I am also a visual artist and um, I, I have a whole theory about how all art is kind of just different manifestations of the same thing. But um, I, in my visual art and in my poetry, I kind of use them together a lot and do visual interpretations of my words and mix them together. So that makes a lot of sense to me, what you're saying about um, seeing, seeing art and poetry, because sometimes I can't really separate it. Mm. It it just goes together. A lot of poets do really interesting things with form, yeah. um, writing their poems in spirals or making the poem form an hourglass or whatever it is they're talking about. One interesting thing that I think about quite a bit is poetic prose. So there's prose poems. That's a different thing. Poetic prose. I don't know if that's a formal term, but it's one that I'm using. Um, I had this discussion or maybe argument, I don't know, it was like a year ago um, in a poetry class about this, um, about poetry in prose books. And one of my favorite authors, Erin Morgenstern, is my favorite example for this because her writing is so poetic. Mm -hmm. Um, I totally think prose authors, not always, but sometimes use really poetic writing. And where's the definition for that? Because for example, in her books, the some of the writing, the imagery and the language so vivid and like luscious, and I would have to give an example, but uh, if you've read it, you, you'd understand. Um, but it's not that thing we're describing with poems where it's really, really personal sensation, unless it's that to the character in the book. 
Sometimes well, or, it is. Or, or it was to the writer. Or it was to the writer. That's simply the expression of yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. So well, I'll, I'll tell you my version of that. And I, to, I read Aaron Morgan Stern's writing, and I agree with you. Ray Bradbury. Ray Bradbury's writing Aaron. is really in Never Neverland. It's got one foot in the in the poetry boat and one foot on yeah. the prose dock because and it weaves back and forth. So and I, I agree, and I, I'm sure about now, somewhere in the world, academics are rotating their heads 360 degrees, feeling a disturbance in the force because there are structural issues that it's make a poem. Thing. I love making academia mad. <laughs> Poetry is very good at that. You know, you know, you know, Zen, Zen poetry, it was a whole doctrinal school of Zen poetry, and you know, they're very minimalist, right? Yeah. But no less poetic. I mean, the you know, Basho was a famous, you know, uh, BCE Zen poet, and his probably best known poem is, you know, still pond, frog jumps in. <laughs> That's vaguely you know, like the, I mean, uh, just a little bit like the imagists, you know, um, everything depends on the red wheelbarrow, something, 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 something by the white chickens. Um, yeah. I never vibed with the imagists, but if you like simplicity like that, then read Ezra Pound. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. You know, re so reading poetry th this blog made me think read about it out it. loud though yeah well read so reading poetry is an entirely different i'm going to call it an aesthetic experience maybe inappropriate use of word but it's a different aesthetic experience than writing poetry um cuz i find the i find writing a poem to be an aesthetic experience purely for me when i do it, it has nothing to do with me sharing it with and I, I don't write poems for anybody to read them anyway i in fact, I don't really write them. I download the poem, the poetry fairy comes, hits me with a wand. I download what she brings, and that's what I get. Um, some sometimes I go back and reread them years later and throw them away, and sometimes I don't. Sometimes they're pretty good. But reading a poem without saying it, reading one out loud is really a different experience, completely different than hearing an audio book, let's say. I don't know how I can't explain how it's different, but it really is. I, I dug out Walt Whitman and when we were doing this blog. I dug out Leaves of Grass and said, let me, let me read some poetry. Forgot how un otherworldly amazing that work is. Leaves of Grass is great. I've got a really cool copy of it. Um, it's, it's, I love what you said about the poetry fairy hits you. For me, it's like I can make the conscious choice. Like I have a, a poetic series of like, I don't remember, 33. 13 could be either there's a three in it poems that I wrote a few years ago um all about anxiety and stuff but those I worked on kind of like a prose short hmm. story like I wrote them I wrote a couple of them really intuitively like you're talking about and then I wrote the other ones a little bit more scripted because it's a narrative so I was like I'm going to write about this here and then I'll like allow it to come to me. But then sometimes it's like 12 AM and I not thinking I'm just writing things that someone else is speaking in my head. And I'm like, this is interesting. Um, and those tend to be the poems that are more, uh, I'll describe as spiritual to me. Um, and that I'm less inclined to share. Um, and those tend to be the poems that I will illustrate. Now I'll illustrate all my poems. That's a lot. Um, but I think it's really interesting to, um, that they can come in different forms. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Poetry to me is, is so mystery magic mm -hmm. i guess i guess for me i've I've never really thought of it that way because i i for po poetry i guess the way i've always experienced it and written it, it it's been a very it's almost a planned thing for me and i i almost sort of use it as i guess i guess sort of a, a verbal advil you might say when when your job is writing all the time you get to the point where you're you're so <laughs> you're so fed up with with writing with writing 
in such in, in such a confined structure writing the same thing that you you want to really relieve that headache with something else and what I do that that's when I kind of turn to poetry sometimes I don't have necessarily a theme I guess that I'm going into write or a story that I'm trying to tell with it but I, I guess I definitely set aside the time that like this is the time I'm going to write poetry because I am shot on prose right now and I need to. <laughs> reinvigorate myself to to be to continue to grow and to be a better writer and to make sure that i'm that i'm creating even prose of of consistently good quality hmm. i really need that that hiatus of doing something that i don't have to worry if my commas are in the right place or if oh, or, yeah. or if uh you know i'm using a a word that is denote as, as it is denote, denoted in the dictionary i i love the the freedom of being able to use words in ways that they technically by by definition they don't necessarily work but because of the way they feel the way they sound the way you experience them they they somehow do uh and and that that that's where my uh, approach came really in writing the blog was that we we live in such a particularly now uh i in in a world of of a lot of of political correctness, there's a lot of emphasis placed on what words mean exactly, and and sometimes context is important, but but uh, sometimes we dwell upon words in a way that I think makes us forget what their purpose is, and and that is to communicate as people, and that is to describe the world as we see it, and to uh, to really record the way we experience it. So for me, poetry is kind of hearkening back to to really the roots of what language is supposed to do, which is is communicate and uh, and share the experiences and the feelings that we as humans all have. You know, Duncan, it seems like with lyrics that that cadence and structure and all that become much more important. Well, they, uh, what Jared's talking about is true because um, poetry allows room for interpretation because you are right, you you are painting a picture. Whereas if you are a writer, what you're doing is describing a picture mm. and you don't leave that room for interpretation uh, based on the reader. So it, it, that's why poetry is a lot like song lyrics, because uh, when you're writing song lyrics, what you're doing is you are planting seeds that in the mind of the listener, both melodically and in the way that the, the lilting narrative of of how the lyrics are sung or expressed what is being conveyed are these momentary situations that the listener threads together to create meaning in the song that may or may not be what the songwriter had been intending but allows the listener to take ownership of that um you have odd songs like um uh, i can't remember the one uh uh Arlo Guthrie, I think it was, who sang 28 minutes about being in jail or whatever. I can't yeah, Alice's Restaurant. Alice's Restaurant. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So that's a very clear descriptive tale that's more storytelling than actual a, 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 a song lyric. So that's why when I was writing my blog, I, you know, big fan of the Flaming Lips. So I was using a couple of examples of Wayne Coyne and the lyrics that he's written for some of their songs where he is either positing an idea or a concept that you grasp your head around and then you're not really listening to the lyrics because you're really still dealing with what that concept is and what that really means and the lyrics is kind of the fringe of this big orb of conceptual thought that you're you know or perspective that you're dealing with um the lyrics get you into that m moment of, of of how you're contemplating what you're thinking about but they don't necessarily propel you forward like an actual narrative would be where it's, you know, plot, action, conflict, and it's the, you know, progression of marching down the field, the necessary saying, field, ball, wind. <laughs> and then suddenly you're like, okay, I can make anything happen with that, you know, whether it's a song or a poem. Can you elaborate on the difference that you think describing a, a picture and painting a picture is? Sure. Well, by painting a picture, what I mean is you have a brush and you're putting colors on a canvas and then it, the person who is viewing your finished art goes and interprets what that painting is, okay? But if you're describing the picture, you've already made that determination of what the picture represents or what you see in the picture with the words that you're saying. So it's not only the volume of words in a poet, and it's, uh, with a poet in poetry, they're using a minimal, minimal amount of words with which to create the art that the audience is then interpreting 
reacting to, it's affecting them viscerally, whatever it might be, much like a painting. But if you're a writer, then your job is to be more effusive with how you describe it and you are limiting what the audience or the reader can interpret unless you're a good writer and leaving room for that. Yeah, or or maybe to build to to maybe strain the metaphor, but maybe poetry is almost more a little more like an abstract painting where, you know, I'm putting it out there. You can look at it and you, the viewer of my work, kind of can decide what you think that is a picture of. Just like somebody hears a poem or reads a poem, yes, they'll know if they speak the language the poem is written in, they'll know empirically what the words mean. I, but the experience of those words in that order that way is different, right? So I don't think we can we can talk about this uh, in uh, February of 2021 without bringing up Amanda Gorman. Go ahead. And, sure. and, and so I go there this way. When I heard her performance at the inauguration, I did not hear her performance at the Super Bowl. I understand it was also quite good. But what struck me, well, what didn't strike you? Phenomenal young woman, amazing talent, great artist, poise under pressure, overcame all kinds of it. What, what, a, what a marvelous person. But what struck me was I listened to this incredible work and went, hmm, this is poetry infused with a little bit of hip hop culture. In, I mean, it, it, it said to me, hey, this is a kind of a quintessential, th this is to poetry what jazz is to music. It's an American syncretic form. You know, mm -hmm. that poem performed that way with that internal rhyme, rhyme scheme, with that performance cadence struck me as this is so unique and so fresh. Well, it was also interesting in the way that she performed it, the hand gestures and the hand movements, very, very scripted, but naturally flowing and gave great emphasis to what she was saying in many ways. It, to me, that was almost performance art, kind of like Laurie Anderson back in the day where her hand movements are, and gestures are as much of the communication as the words that she's saying. And so I, I really enjoyed that aspect of her you know, performance separate from you know, the actual poem that she was, you know, sharing. Yeah, I hadn't even thought about that, but you're right. There was almost a, a balletic or interpretive dance yeah. component yeah. to the expression of the poetry. Very much Performative so. poetry is, oh, yes, it's a whole thing. I, I, I did a, I was in a class. I don't even remember what it was called, um, but I did a poet, poetry performance thing. Um and it was all like it becomes very like you move with the words, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I I don't remember what I was watching or reading. Someone was talking about um, language and connection with motion. Um, I think that's really interesting. Yeah, well, and and so ry rhythm is the word that pops up for me in all in all that discussion. Poetry has rhythm in a way that yeah. You know, Prose has it, but poetry has a very expressed, sensed rhythm in a way that that I think prose doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, you know, if you have a rhyme scheme and you have a meter and you're doing, you know, it's obvious. If you don't, if you're writing looser, more free form, or to, to Olivia's point, point, you know, poetic prose, that rhythm is a little more subtle, but it's still there. And and even to place where you where you break where you break a line and start a new line or Put a put an intentional pause or comma where normally grammatically you wouldn't. That to me, those are rhythmic cues, and you're telling the the reader when you read this, I want you to hear it, and I want you to hear it this way with this kind of beat or this kind of syncopation. You know, uh, it it's a it it is a medium. I think that it's funny too historically. You know. The whole notion of poetry sort of has waxed and waned over history. It's enjoyed periods of great prominence and popularity, and then it kind of sinks into oblivion for a while. And it's like, huh, poetry, you know. But uh, I think we're in it. We're in a phase of our culture, of our culture anyway, where the appreciation of things that could be called poetry is higher than say it was in the seventies. You know, um, it's, it's it's been restored within what groups. Uh, lots of groups. Just, just generally, if you take the, I, I, I'm an, I'm a U.S. person, so when I look at U.S. culture, I would argue there's a, there's a broader acceptance of, appreciation of, and willingness to engage 
things that are poetry right now than there was 30 or 40 years ago. Well, I think, I think it's, it's interesting as far, I guess, I think a lot of it has to do with, with the branding of it too, I guess you might say mm-hmm. is that things I, I, I would not say at least in my, and among my generation, there's necessarily people would identify as, as poetry lovers or people. I mean, I, when I went through school, people still groaned when we got to the poetry unit, except for those that liked Dr. Seuss or whatever, but <laughs> they, they, uh, but you know, the, the culture of, of hip hop and rap, which I certainly consider to be po- some of it, at least to be highly poetic. Oh yeah. I mean, that, that is arguably the dominant musical art form of, of, of today. And I, I mean, I don't, I don't think that they, they, they don't brand themselves as poets, but I mean, in, in a lot of ways, I think there are many poets among them. So it's, I, I think that there's such a, I think that that maybe there's a bit of a negative association with the word poetry that it you know it's dull it doesn't make any sense it's 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 frivolous it, it doesn't necessarily have a communicative purpose among in in popular culture but then when you reframe it and repackage it as something else it's a very uh it's a very lucrative and very powerful art form so I think it's interesting the way it's it's framed up nowadays. I mean, Barnes and Noble wouldn't have such a huge shelf of <laughs> contemporary poets if people weren't buying them. Um, the other side is we we've seen po- cl- more classical poets having a resurgence. I mean, Emily Dickinson has had a resurgence in the Emily. last decade. Yeah, absolutely. By the way, I would but argue. Like, too. Why wouldn't she? She's Emily Dickinson. She's for, but for good reason. Yeah. She, her work's amazing, right? Yeah, so, you know, you talk about hip hop. To me, in, in my life, I'm a little older than you guys. The last time that really happened was in the 50s and 60s with the beat poets. Of course. The yeah. beat poets, compl- again, uniquely American, you know, Absolutely. European influence, but uniquely American. The beat poets utterly re- redefined the entire sense of what poetry is, you know. Um, and and like any, it's not all good, you know. Not all, you know. But it's yeah. subjective. Poetry is an entirely subjective art form, like all art. But like, <laughs> mm, yeah, I argue with people about that constantly. Yeah, well, but all art is. I mean, you know, so is literature. Yes, that's you know? the point. So, so is food. Yeah. You know, <laughs> some people well, believe it's like Titus Andronicus. Who likes Titus Andronicus? I'm sure someone does. <laughs> Shakespeare probably did. <laughs> it was one of his early plays. We'll cut him some slack, you know. I mean, yeah. you know, you don't want to be talking bad about the bard in a, in a podcast about poetry. Yeah, but but it, much like art, it's in the eye of the beholder. So you know, if if you're down with you know Latin rhyming or you like poetry slams and the urbanization of mm-hmm. poetry with hip hop or, or rap roots, it doesn't matter. It's what the you know the audience is king. And so, you know, some people are going to appreciate a modern art gallery. Some people are going to want to go to a classical gallery. You know, it, it, I, it's a, I drive people crazy. I like those weird issues. exhibits that say, like, on a plaque, there are radio waves in this room. Yeah. So that's OK. You know, that's fine, too. You know, um, w- one word printed in the middle of a page is somebody's poem. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> How dare anybody say it's not. Somebody would publish like a blank book. Like, as a statement, I'm such a pretentious English student, but like, I accept this about myself. I do remember going to MoMA. There is that, there's a plaque on the wall that said, this art exhibit is the invisible radio waves permeating this space. Yeah. Okay. I hate that. I love that. I'm I'm okay with that, I guess. Well, (laughs) you know, I think, I think we've, we certainly determine one thing about poetry, which is wh- whatever it is, it's extraordinarily subjective. Um, and I'm delighted personally about that because it, it means that, you know, there's still freedom out there. You know, um, the, uh, the, the structuralists get to have their day, but, you know, it's still the, it's still the wilderness for the rest of us. And, you know, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll keep, my frenetic pace of a poem every year and a half up probably till I'm dead. And then I'll put them in a file and probably they'll get a race, but it is, it is a, it, I find it a refreshing to Jared's point earlier. It's a refreshing moment. It, it, oddly, <laughs> I write poems when I'm in two mental states, either when I'm completely destroyed emotionally 
or when I'm completely on top of the world emotionally. I never write them when I'm in the middle, you know, and uh, and the depressive ones aren't depressing poems and the ebullient times are not necessarily really yippy happy poems. That's just I kind of have to be in an extreme mode yep. for that to, for that part of me to work. But that's when you have the most clarity. When you are in the bottom of the trough, you see things very clearly. And when you're at the peak of the mountain, you see things very clearly. Anytime you're I would in- argue against oh, that yeah. personally. Well, you may you may not experience I mean, it that way. I experience way. the world, but when I am um, at the bottom of an anxiety well, I do not experience things clearly at all. And when I'm on top of the world, I also do not experience things clearly at all. I get very impulsive. Well, maybe not experience things experiencing things clearly is a good way to write a poem too. I mean, you know. No, it is. It's great. I, yeah. My anxiety poems are fantastic. Um, I think that's really I feel terrible. I'm not, I'm not saying cognitively that you have that clarity. I'm saying emotionally you have that clarity. When you are at the bottom of the trough and you feel that pain, you have you, you're dealing with that yeah. kind of crap and dysfunction. It's very sharp. It's very pungent. It's very poignant. That nothing else gets in the way. You have to soak in that, you know, self empathy. Just like when you're at the pinnacle and you're in that euphoria and you're just riding high on the endorphins. I mean, they block out everything else, and that's all you feel. That's what I mean by the clarity. Well, that's, and that's that's the invitation to the poetry fairy. Absolutely. You know, that's how she shows up. Why don't we leave it there with the poetry fairy? Um, oh. Uh, could I just, we can't talk poetry without referencing the headmaster from the wall. Poems, everybody. Poems. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love it. Next time, what are we doing next time? We're doing. We're talking about storytellers as thieves, I believe. Storytellers yes. as One thieves. One kind, I believe. <laughs> All right. Yeah. That'll be good. Well, I'm uh, looking forward to that. And we hope you will look forward to that too. And you'll check us out at Ideas On on our blog and also look for our podcast and, of course, our YouTube channel. Appreciate you being with us and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Bye bye. Go write some poetry. Go write some poetry. That's right.